say, say thank you to the people that are here. Very, very good to see you. Welcome to our session on Turn On The Night and thank you for joining us. Um, we are pleased, very, very pleased to be part of the capstone to the amazing conference that we've had in the last four days. And uh, today or tonight, wherever you are, you are in for a treat. In the spirit of this conference, this event is about uh, it's going to be half about the science updates with respect to dark skies protection issues, and then the other half uh, about dark skies education programs you can use and the cultural heritage that is at the heart of why we protect our dark starry night skies. So your presenters here are part of the International Astronomical Union's Commission on the Protection of Observatory Sites. And the protection these days is mostly uh, from light pollution and recently satellite constellations. So during the first hour, let's see, let's see if I can go to the next slide here. Oops. So during the first hour, Richard Green will speak to the protection of ground-based observatories. And Richard is a, uh, an astronomer and the assistant director for government relations at Stewart Observatory at the University of Arizona here in, where I am in Tucson, Arizona, USA. He's right across the street, basically, if we were, if we were at work, but we're at home. <laughs> um, and then I will talk about the impacts of satellite constellations on astronomy. Um, I'm also an astronomer uh, at the NSF National Science Foundation's Noir Lab in Tucson, Arizona, USA. And Noir Lab is the basically new National Observatory for the USA. Uh, I'm involved in a variety of different light pollution and satellite constellation projects, basically. Um, and then Pedro Sanhuesa will speak to the protection of dark skies oases and he will also speak to the protection of the bioenvironment. And Pedro is the director of the Oficina de Protección de la Calidad del Cielo, Cielo del Norte de Chile, or the Northern Chile, mm -hmm. uh, Northern Chile Sky Quality Protection Office in English. <laughs> I hope I said that okay, Pedro. <laughs> um, and, and at the okay. end of, is it okay? <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of our talks, we will leave a discussion period where you can ask us uh, questions and uh, hopefully on the presentations. <laughs> um, and then after the Q&A, we will start a second hour, and that's the hour on uh, Dark Skies Education and the cultural heritage part of our uh, session. And so now I hand the mic over to Richard. Hello, everyone. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. And what I wanted to talk about was the, a recent activity that was conducted that Connie actually chaired. And that was under the joint sponsorship of the International Astronomical Union and the United Nations, as well as the observatory uh, in the Canaries, IAC. And, and there were working groups who got together in order to create recommendations that might be endorsed by the United Nations in order to protect dark and quiet skies. So the working group that I was with um, was very broad. It contained astronomers and dark sky advocates and lighting engineers and lighting manufacturers. And we tried to, and did I think, reach a consensus on what it would take for local governments to actually protect the dark skies around observatories. So next slide. Oops, sorry. So I'll bet that in your teaching or with your neighbors, people have asked you, well, if things are getting worse on the ground, can't you just do all of astronomy from space? And the short answer is no. Um, that the ground-based telescopes can be built bigger because they're much less expensive than having to launch into an orbit. And for instance, around the world on the ground, there are 40 optical telescopes with mirrors in the range of three meters up to effectively 11 meters. And they're sighted all over the world in the US, Chile, Spain, and you see South Africa, almost every continent. Um, and so it's a worldwide investment and there is no telescope currently in orbit in that size range at all. Hubble's only 2.3 meters. They not only 
do key astronomical science, but they provide critical data for planetary defense. That is to say, to look at incoming in case there's an asteroid on a, on a trajectory that might hit the Earth. And key aspects of what we call space situational awareness, looking at all those satellites in orbit around the Earth, knowing where they are. Next slide, please. So just as one example, as you've completed this fantastic workshop about and how big data impinges things, here's a perfect example of big data because Vera Rubin Observatory, as you've heard, under construction has this amazing three gigapixel camera and it's going to, in the end, tell us a lot about dark matter by the way that it stretches, by, that gravity bends light from distant galaxies, as you can see in a strong case in that picture. But it's also true, we think, that the matter is in a, a distribution, a wispy distribution called the cosmic web. And in order to trace the extent of the gas going along those walls of that web, there are two big projects going on, one in Chile and one in Arizona that require blue-green spectra of very faint objects. And so you need the best dark skies and those skies need protecting. Next slide. So is there a problem? The answer is yes, there's an urgent problem. Just for example, from monitoring from satellites and other ways of measuring, the globally averaged rate of increase of light in the sky, both in terms of how much area has is impacted by artificial night sky lighting and how much light total went, grew at 2% per year. And that's twice the rate that the world population is growing. So that's a bad trend. And we think there are three reasons why. One is that the world population is growing. And, and so if you just had the num amount of light per person, that would increase for sure. Economic growth makes light at night more affordable for people. And the fact that there are new lighting technologies that have greatly reduced the power cost per light out allows people to get more. So um, there are a generation of observatories that have been built um, in places that were had very low populations 40, 50 years ago that are now growing. And these are some of the best astronomical sites in terms of weather. They now have an issue with little, little towns, nearby observatories, and big cities not far away, putting a lot of artificial light into the sky. Next slide. This is a famous image. It's actually a model based on down-looking weather satellite data. And it's a model of what a dark adapted um, uh, human eye might see in terms of the sky glow above them where they live. And so red and white are the worst and blue and black are, are dark. And if you look, the, the left has the, the spectral band pass, the color sensitivity of the satellite. The one on the right shows you what things look like if you take into account the spectrum of the actual lighting. Uh, so you extrapolate a little bit and how that would impact night vision. And you can see that there are very few places in the continent of Europe, just for example, or at least Western Europe, where you have a pristine night sky. And in some places in East Asia, people never get dark adapted at night. Their outside lighting environment is so bright. Next slide. So what's a good observing site? Well, our professional society has made a definition, and that is <coughs> it, the, art, the contribution of artificial light to the natural air glow has to be less than 10%, halfway between zenith and horizon in any direction you look. Most of the big telescopes aren't anywhere close to that, but they still require a strong coordination with something going on. And even the telescopes in the most remote sites have have human activity. It might be mining, it might be military exercises in empty places, it might be a border with another country, which is what that picture is. Um, there is some, some human activity that puts light into the sky, and so it really needs local and national control. Next slide. 
Thanks. So part of the reason that things are changing so fast is that our old discharge tube outside night lighting, like high pressure sodium lights are being replaced and displaced by solid state light emitting diodes. And so it's a genuine threat to astronomical observation. The natural way that those diodes emit light is in the deep blue, and then they have something that reprocesses the light into a visible light spectrum, as you see on the left. And so there's a lot more blue-green content to outdoor lighting than there used to be when you saw low pressure or high pressure sodium lamps. They also put out a lot more light per watt of energy in than discharge tubes used to. And so it's tempting to just say, okay, I'm spending, this is my electrical bill for my city. I'll just get that much more light on the road, but it goes elsewhere, of course. On the other hand, that same lighting can be a benefit. Um, because they're easy to turn, they go off and on, they're designed to be turned off and on quickly. And so they can be, um, if, yeah, if we could go forward to that, that one, thanks. Um, they, um, they can be turned off and on very quickly. And so for instance, they could be motion activated. When, when there's little to no traffic, they can be off. They have good optics. They have a lot of custom optics. And so the light can be focused where you want it and not scattered where you don't want it. And that reprocessing of the natural blue light can be made in a way that you can actually adjust the spectral bandwidth. So it may not be so bad in the blue and green. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, previous slide. <laughs> So what we did was to say, okay, if the United Nations could recommend a set of a guidance for that local communities and, and regions and nations could use as a model, that would be really great. And it has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis because the situation in Northern Chile is very different from that on the California coast. So in each place, you have to assess where you are, how fast things are growing and what needs to be changed. So our goal in recommending this is that the, we want to slow, stop, and reverse the growth of artificial light in the sky on a decade timescale and faster if at all possible. Next slide, please. So how do you do that? Well, the lighting engineers tell us correctly, if people would actually follow good lighting practice, we'd be a lot of the way there. You, you match how much light you need to what you need to do. You don't make color where you don't need color. You use good lenses to focus the light exactly where you want it. But there are two ways to do that. One is to define what we call a near zone, somewhere close in right around the observatory, which has really strong regulation on the lighting, like no lights at all, unless there's absolutely a need for some pre-existing activity that's already there. And that radius is typically 30 kilometers, but it will vary a lot from site to site. And we recommend you make it as big as possible. However, it's also true that um, cities, even as far away as 300 kilometers, create a dome of light from all their artificial light at night. And those require special regulations as well in order to keep that dome low and receding with time. Next slide. So here's an example of an all sky camera. And this one is at Peak du Midi, at, but it's just interesting that even Toulouse, which is far away, has a little <coughs> dome of light on the horizon that can ultimately impact um, observations. And so that's why both villages nearby, the one at 30 kilometers, and cities far away, over 100 kilometers, both need to consider regulations to make the sky at the observatory as dark as possible. Next slide. There we go, thanks. So 
what kind of light pollution matters for observatories? Well, there are two kinds. One is when lights are shining directly there, which is more unusual because observatories tend still, the professional ones with the big telescopes tend to be farther away from actual city lights. And so therefore it's more common that the particles and the molecules of air will take light that's coming upward from the ground and scatter it in the direction of the observatory. And that can be true both for the light that is emitted above horizontal, which is the worst, and that we can regulate, but it's also true that light will bounce off the ground and back into the sky and then get scattered. And so that's one of the primary sources of the light domes over cities. Next slide. So, what are the techniques that we recommend to keep those city lights down and to keep the villages and other activities close to observatories as dark as possible? What the IAU has said for years, full shielding, no light traveling above horizontal or even close to it because that right above horizontal as has been shown in, in published work, and Connie was a co-author on one of them, um, that has the longest legs. The, that light goes the farthest and really is the worst for the observatories. Blue light scatters a lot, and blue-green light is, blue-green now is the darkest part of the spectrum for astronomers, and so these new lights that have blue-green content are really, they, they make the biggest percentage increase of artificial light since there's hardly any now. So limiting the content in the blue-green region and, and into the near ultraviolet is very important to preserve dark skies in that color range. Um, there are a number of um, engineering professional guidance on how much light is required to safely carry out activities. That is often given in a range and, and you've got to go to the bottom of that range in order to, in, in the cities and villages nearby observatories. Um, the best thing is when there's no traffic, don't advertise, turn off that, turn off those lights. Don't paint the side of your building with um, something, you know, some decorative lighting when there are no people around. So curfews really matter and lighting level can drop if a road at rush hour in the dark has a lot of traffic and then two hours later, there's hardly any cars. You can drop the light level in modern solid state lighting. Um, there are, we need to make sure that the light falls where it was intended. Um, you can take advantage of natural obstructions, uh, you know, and, and if there's a building, you put the light so that the building shields the observatory direction. And finally, a, a critical one, if we could go forward, that would be helpful, thanks. Um, thanks. Um, the critical one is lumen caps by region. And that is to say, on the basis of a computed model of how much light is in the sky, in order to say we have to stop the growth, you have to say, well, how much light is actually allowed outdoors in zones around the observatory and then put that limit on and make it actually part of the regulation. And so that's one of the biggest challenges. That one was the hardest to get a consensus on because it's a, it's a concept that planners don't normally think about, but that in the end is what's going to be required. Next slide, please. So urban areas have all kinds of outdoor activity, and this is all the lighting situations we were talking about, that when it's not, when it's safety, you take the minimum required as per standard, and when it's for joy, um, you turn it off <laughs> near observatories. Next slide. So the IAU has made a declaration for universal light to start right to starlight, and that goes into cities themselves. And so full shielding, curfews, turning off the floodlights when it's late, and dimming bright, turning bright sources off after main business hours really matters. So what's relevant here to this meeting is that our goals can be accomplished only through worldwide education. And we really need to have effective ways to reach out to the public and tell them about how we need to preserve dark sky as a natural resource in the context of sustainability. So thanks.
Well, thank you very, very much, Richard. That was excellent. Um, well, um, we're going to hold questions, though, until the end and just have our uh, there's three, two more presentations. Um, so um, if, if that's OK with everyone, um, I'm sorry for the trigger happiness of the of my mouse. And uh, Richard, um, it, honestly, it has a ghost in it. I would just move to do something else, come back, and it would do something bad. So now I know I can't <laughs> I can't move my mouse or anything. But, um, to, to uh, when I'm sharing screen, I guess. Uh, so this next section we're going to be uh, presenting is on the impact of satellite constellations on the field of astronomy. Um, I'm the lucky person giving that presentation. Um, the research for this work was done by uh, basically two groups at this point. One group was a satellite constellation working group for um, uh, a workshop that happened at the end of June. Uh, a lot of astronomers from around the world uh, involved in that. It's called SATCON 1. We're hoping to have a SATCON 2 next year. Um, and then more recently, and, and a little bit more in depth, and also um, with all the other working groups that you, you're hearing from today, from Richard and from uh, two working groups from Pedro and the SATCON group and a radio astronomy group, were all involved in the dark and quiet skies uh, workshop that we had. And again, like Richard had mentioned, we had all this research done before the workshop and people presented the work, uh, their work at the workshop. And there was a lot of discussion and a lot of revision that the uh, audience provided in feedback to the resulting report. Um, so <clears throat> just to start off uh, and all of this, uh, in May of last year, uh, we experienced our first uh, launch of 60 Starlink Constellation satellites, and they basically were from SpaceX. Um, uh, <laughs> and astronomers from around the world were a bit on the shocked side. Um, and SpaceX engineers, when we talked to them, they were shocked that we were shocked. So it was kind of an odd situation. They, you know, come to find out if they had known we uh, were going to be shocked, they would have actually uh, reached out and talked to us in advance, and we would have had a dialogue uh, going even sooner, which is a, a good thing to know. Uh, and ever since then, I'll tell you a little bit more about the kind of dialogue we've been having since. But anyway, be that as it may, 60 satellites were launched all at once, and they could be seen. Um, okay, so, so uh, not only do we have the issues with the LED outdoor lighting that Richard spoke about, but we found ourselves on the verge of industrial, industrializing space. And we're now facing the impacts of astronomy that that will bring, basically. So in this talk, we'll focus on the impact, as I said, and they're from uh, some big companies right now. And there are a lot of other companies, too. But right now, we're, we're basically talking with SpaceX and Amazon uh, with their Kuiper project and OneWeb. <coughs> Um, and that's on the visible astronomy side. Um, and we are hoping that uh, by the end of this presentation that you might choose to bring awareness to your students and your colleagues on the impacts of satellite constellations on astronomy. And if you would like to join us in our efforts, please contact me and, and we can uh, get you involved as well. Uh, we would really enjoy that. Okay. This thing. <laughs> so uh, I'm a very visual learner, um, and I thought that I would present this to you. It is a little 15-second uh, video on uh, 107,000 satellites that are planned in the next, say, 10 years. And let me give show you that first. So this starts in about 2017-2018 uh, and goes through about two th 2019. Um, so uh, at, a, at a typical observatory, I just want to bring some points up here, um, say that like the mega uh, observatories we have down in Chile are located at about minus 30 latitude. Uh, and also we have some observatories near me at plus 30 uh, that are major observatories. Uh, there, you'll see at those, specifically those locations, you'll see more than 5,000 satellites. Well, they'll be, well, you won't see them, but they'll be overhead in the, uh, in the horizon at any one time. And of these, several thousand to a few hundred will be illuminated by the sun and detectable. Um, without satellite operators reducing the brightness of these satellites, um, up to several hundred satellites will be visible to the naked eye. Um, and, and so things like wide field 
uh, photography that you might be interested in doing will be strongly impacted. And observ uh, observations that, that are made with wide field of view telescopes uh, will be severely impacted as well as um, observatories that take long exposures. So uh, particularly close to the horizon where you see more of these, um, more of these satellites. So I asked to go to the next slide, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so there are three principal factors uh, of impacts on astronomy and astronomical observations from satellite constellations. And they are the numbers of, you can, you can pr pretty much predict this, but they're very logical. The number of visible satellites makes a big difference. Uh, their orbital altitude, um, that's how high they are above the ground, obviously. And then uh, the apparent brightness and uh, and their attitude. And by attitude, I don't know if you can see me, but I have this little, oh, put it close to you maybe, the mock-up of <laughs> the shape of a, oh dear, of a, of a, a sec, uh, Starlink satellite. And it's, it's, it's like an L shape. And, um, and if you uh, orient it in one, uh, like face on, then you'll get a lot of brightness, right? But they're agreeing now in, when they're raising up to their final orbits to actually go knife edge, as they call it. So very, very little of the surface will be visible. So that's kind of cool. So that's one, one thing too, that if, if other satellite companies can do the same thing, uh, that'll, give, that'll help reduce the, the um, brightness, for instance. So it's pretty cool. So, um, so the, the number of visible satellites, the first bullet there, uh, I went ahead of myself a little bit, but the, the, uh, is increasing from a few hundred just a year ago to over 100,000, as I just showed you in the next few years. Uh, for the orbital altitude, the second bullet there, um, if at any altitude, you will notice um, the amount of, of bright satellites is greatest near the horizon and pretty much during twilight when the sun's hitting uh, these, these satellites. Um, but if they are at higher altitudes, they stand a greater chance of staying uh, visible, um, detectable actually too, um, uh, all night. Uh, if the higher they go, like 1,200 kilometers, as opposed to under 600 kilometers, for instance. So it's a it's a it's another negotiating point, which is going to probably be the hardest point because one web, which is going to be at 1,200 kilometers, is not going to budge from being at 1,200 kilometers. So. Uh, anyways, um, so you would think uh, you would think that the closer they are, <laughs> the better. I mean, the, the further away they are, the better because they'll be less bright, and that's true to some extent, but not overall when you consider how long they are up in the night sky. Um, okay, so on the bo bottom right hand of, the, of part of the screen here, you're going to see this. Is, actually, it's a satellite trail, and this was actually taken in the lab. But the same sort of thing will happen on a telescope. So you have a shutter of the camera open. Right, and and uh, it takes data, and it's gonna uh, go across the the image there as it as it proceeds across the sky, and you will get a trail instead of just a dot. Right, so this trail is, is as you see here is saturated because the satellite is very very bright, and you also get these secondary lines, and that's not good. Now, in the, if the if the satellite is less than like what they call seventh magnitude in brightness, you can pretty much with software get rid of those two two lines and that's what uh, SpaceX is, is shooting for that we can at least get rid of what they call residual lines but at this point right now the, the main big bright line there will pretty much stay on some of the telescopes that are sensitive enough to uh, take this kind of data. Uh, the, the image above it um, has uh, a, a lot of satellites you see <laughs> from Starlink but that's right after launch it's a few it's a week one two or three weeks after launch you have them all bunched together for a while as they're raising up to what they call um, uh, sort of a, a midpoint and then they raise up after that to the final um, altitude of 550 kilometers so they're going to be bunched and that that's that you know that, that you can get a little too sensationalistic about this and so that um, only happens uh, after launch for a few weeks but the thing is they're launching every few weeks so every two to three weeks they're launching so you might see something like this more often for a while uh, and anyway, so those are the kinds of <laughs> challenges that uh, the principal factors, oops, sorry, that we're, we're facing at the moment. Um, okay, so let me go to the next slide here. Um, and also, just to let you know, there are, uh, there's a future we have to think about. So the satellite, um, the impact of satellites on astronomy will also have an impact on future technology in our field. And that requires those uh, new telescopes that are going to be, you know, plus eight meters by a long shot are going to um, 
uh, need dark skies even more than ever. So a tremendous amount of new technology in astronomy that represents billions of dollars in federal investment is coming online in the near future and um, you know, within the next decade. And uh, observatories require uh, dark night skies to uncover the secrets to some of the most fundamental questions about the nature of our universe. Um, okay, so the, the issue is immediate. And there's two areas that it, where it's immediate. One is the astronomical urgency that even, uh, that, uh, even with mitigation, satellites will saturate detectors as I mentioned, on research telescopes of moderate to large apertures. Um, and that even uh, for the second urgency, the broader urgency, that there's basically nothing that uh, will, at this point in time, and we're trying to rectify this through uh, the IU, through the UN, but um, there's really nothing to stop right now an operator or a satellite or satellite industry, that is, to, um, um, to, to launch, you know, constellations by the thousands, basically, to the, and to, to the visible eye, uh, you know, visible to the eye and also um, destructive to uh, certain telescopes uh, that we have. So uh, the solution, of course, is to work with the satellite industry. So it's, you know, I'm sorry if I make it too dire, but, you know, that's the circumstance we find ourselves in. But we can, and we've seen uh, with these three major companies that I mentioned before, that they are willing to talk and to try to come up with mitigation strategies. Um, and to reach their goals and our goals, uh, which is a great, great thing. And we've made great strides with uh, SpaceX, which I think I forgot to show you. Well, maybe, oh yeah, I have it. I have it in two more slides. I'll show you their, the two solutions that they have come up with so far. We're not quite there in, in fulfilling our goals with those two solutions, but we're hopeful. So what have astronomers done, get to the next slide, uh, to help uh, work toward that goal? Um, we, <laughs> and we had, as I mentioned before, two major workshops, uh, and in both cases, we had, uh, groups doing research, you know, experts from all around the world before the workshops to present at those workshops. So it was pretty impressive. Um, uh, but for the first workshop, the satellite constellation workshop or the SATCON one workshop, uh, we uh, started after the launch, the, the scary launch to, um, the AAAS, the American Astronomical Society, um, had uh, set up uh, conference, conversations with SpaceX, which I was lucky enough to be involved every month for about a year so far. Um, and then it led to uh, a wonderful uh, special session we had at the AAAS, which we're going to have another one in January. Um, and this one more towards policy. The last one was more towards uh, mitigation solutions, basically. In the uh, areas that were impacted and the mitigation, possible mitigation solutions. And then we had that workshop where that was actually uh, researched and presented, as I mentioned. Uh, and, um, and the whole thing, all of this is going to feed hopefully into what we call an e-institute, where stakeholders can do research and develop software and do observations on these satellites and do mitigation testing and come up with a bunch of solutions that they hopefully can implement and share. That's the whole thing. And, and stuff on policy too, we want to get into. So um, there's no sense in not sharing this information. We don't want to recre recreate, you know, the wheel basically. So um, anyway, so the kinds of things that uh, the SATCON 1 came up with, um, and here are the two satellites, DarkSat and VisorSat, that uh, SpaceX developed in response to our needs, which is great. Um, um, the observatories, we, we thought about it in three different ways. One where the solutions that observatories can actually make, one that the, the satellite operators could make, and then one that uh, both observatories and the satellite operators or the satellite industry could uh, make together. So for observatories, we thought, well, okay, there's trail removal that I spoke of in the images, um, and then other simulations that we could possibly uh, do that we have done already. And uh, as well, and then satellite operations could work on their minimizing their brightnesses. And so DarkSat was one where they painted part of it black, basically. The, and those are the four uh, phased arrays, uh, the antennas that you see it there, and um, uh, on the flat bottom of the, of, of the SpaceX um, satellite. And they were painted, and it got uh, two and a half times maybe darker. Uh, <coughs> 
<clears throat> but not like, you know, several times darker as we had wanted. And um, in order to be able to remove the uh, secondary um, images, you know, the effects on the images I showed you. And then VisorSat, um, is, we're still kind of taking more data on it. A lot of people have, we're still reducing the data to see how much uh, improvement. It's a little bit better than dark sets that we see so far, but still it's almost there, but not quite. So visor set was actually uh, like a visor that was put on the, uh, in front of the arrays that you see in the upper panel uh, that was set, done on the, uh, little in the like sun shields, basically. <laughs> um, and then of course the observatory and the operators together can work on uh, an observing network and improve what they call ephemerities, which are uh, positions, the future positions of a satellite and share that, which they've been doing already. So um, there's a lot of cool things that can happen and to solve this problem. Okay, so, oops, sorry. All right, so the other, con um, uh, sorry, the other workshop that was um, supported by, well, the UN had asked us to do this, first of all, a few years back, and it, they had asked the IEU to, um, to support a workshop on dark and quiet skies that would uh, protect the dark and quiet skies. So both radio and, um, and, um, uh, the visible wavelengths. And so, um, and then of course, along the way, the satellite constellation stuff happened. So we actually had a total of five working groups and you're hearing from four of them today. Um, and we did create uh, after the workshop um, and based on people's feedback, a, a workshop report basically in three different formats. <laughs> One of those is going to the UN <coughs> and they're almost done, not quite, but they're almost done. And the UN delegates will hopefully read it before their meeting in February. And they'll be presented hopefully by some country um, uh, in the UN uh, in February. And uh, that's, you know, going to go forth to a, yet another meeting in June and another meeting in October, hopefully. And uh, we'll see how this happens. But this hopefully will be so that they can have um, basically a framework for recommendations uh, that they can uh, um, share with countries and ask countries to participate in. So, um, and again, this will all feed into the same E Institute that I spoke of before. So, um, sorry. So next slide. Um, Okay, so uh, the main recommendations were basically very, very similar to the SACCON one, so I'm not going to go over them again, but they went beyond that too. Uh, there were, in the satellite constellation uh, working group, there were 40 <laughs> recommendations, and I don't think you guys <laughs> want to hear all 40, but the main ones here are pretty much the, the same or very similar to the ones that we went over uh, for the SACCON one conference. Okay. And uh, so, um, <laughs> so in, if this is one of my last slides here. Um, so if you are amenable, uh, we would like to enlist your assistance in spreading the word. If more people know and understand, the better are our chances for dark skies to be preserved on local levels and internationally. And entities like uh, the IAU will have a better chance to actually uh, do something on a worldwide level with the UN, for instance. And um, and so the era of increasingly easy and rapid access to space is here. We cannot avoid it. SpaceX, uh, on the other hand, has worked earnestly and sincerely uh, to mitigate the impact of their satellites and uh, advocacy must be continue to build on the collaborative framework established thus far. And we tend to think in terms of conflict, but we shouldn't just think that way. We should also think in terms of opportunity. So, um, so thank you very much for, for staying with me on this. <laughs> I'd like to hand, uh, I'd like to actually um, go to the next slide just for a second. We can come back to the slide perhaps uh, at the end, but here are, our, and we'll um, somehow provide this to you if, if you don't get the presentation. Um, but here are all the links for the reports, the presentations and the videos from the, both of the workshops. And thank you very much. Um, so I'd like now to hand over the baton or the mic <laughs> to Pedro Sanwesa. Pedro? Yeah, here. Oh. You may begin. Thank you, Connie. I hope everything is okay. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Well, I have to run because I have many issues to talk about and we had a, quite a great job in, in, with all the conference uh, that was uh, held uh, in last October. So 
First of all, uh, congratulations to Beatriz and the team for this successful activity. I, I have some friends participating in this conference, so um, and I hope they, they, they are here uh, today in this turn on the night session. So uh, first, uh, I, I will go to talk about the dark sky oasis or dark sky places. So next one, please. <laughs> so here, uh, I have to, to explain that the material is a result uh, of uh, interdisciplinary work uh, of many specialists of different fields uh, related uh, to light pollution or ALAN, which is artificial light at night, under the leadership of Dr. John Earnshaw uh, from New Zealand. Um, well, a dark sky oasis is a dark, it's a dark uh, sky place uh, located in a place uh, where the night sky is protected uh, by an outdoor lighting policy or some legal terms. Uh, bottom right, you have uh, the Oraki Mackenzie International Dark Sky Reserve, the, the, the main postal of that place. It's a very beautiful and well protected place. Congratulations, Jon, for that for the job of all the team. And on the other side, on the bottom left, we have the National Park, uh, Fry Jorge National Park, which is also uh, part of uh, one of the reserves uh, uh, submitted under the uh, Starlight Foundation uh, that I will explain uh, 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 soon. And also it is near our Noel Lab Aura facilities in northern Chile, Cerro Tololo, for example, Gemini, LSST, which is under construction nowadays. So next one, please. So as you can see, uh, those uh, images and the right and on, on, on the left uh, can show us that those special places uh, that are protected are at the end very fragile. Uh, the spill of light, uh, light pollution, uh, as seen on the on the bottom right uh, image, can affect the landscape at enormous distances uh, be because of the of the street lighting, the light from small fields, uh, commercial facilities, industries. Uh, like in this image, for example, this is a, a, a mine area in northern Chile, uh, flood lights of buildings, etc. So they are under risk and they have to be protected. The next one, please. Well, as I said before, the, the most important agencies uh, providing accreditation uh, of dark sky places are the Satellite Foundation, as I said, based on Tenerife, Canary Island in Spain. And the other one is the International Dark Sky Association based in Tucson, Arizona, in the USA. Uh, it is interesting to consider that by this year, at the end of this year, we have more than 200 dark sky places uh, in 27 countries, uh, which some uh, kind of accreditation. Uh, the next one, please. So now, please, uh, here we have a look at the variety of the dark sky, uh, variety of types of dark sky places, officially protected, that we have uh, by now. Uh, from going from astronomy sites, national parks, uh, having also nice sky protection, some heritage, and I say the cultural sites, outreach sites uh, like public observatories, reserves, uh, communities, uh, referring to rural areas, villages, or town in which the protection of the nice skies is shared, uh, it's a shared effort of local stakeholders, which is so interesting uh, for the future developing of such a protection site. The next one, please. And now, uh, there are our recommendations uh, for the group of experts uh, to the Committee for the Peaceful Use of uh, Outer Space. Uh, first, we have to assume the default condition of non-artificial light as a baseline in everywhere, of course, if possible. Uh, it needed in an ecological sensitive natural area or in their surroundings, the non-blue lights must be a default condition, uh, which means the amber LED or low pressure sodium lamps uh, and the image in the, in, in the upper right, uh, on the right, uh, shows you a source of light, a LED, 
a number one, which with no blue light, as you can see in, in, in the other image. Uh, it, the second interesting and relevant recommendation is uh, that no light uh, has to be scattered uh, horizontally or even upward. Uh, and, and you have in, in the bottom uh, right uh, an image of uh, pictures, which is put in horizontal, sending all the light uh, to the ground. And another recommendation is that it is needed the uh, the third one is to use the minimum amount of light as, as possible according to the visual task being performed in the place. Um, and perhaps we, we, we can talk also about another recommendation in uh, that I say is, is rather exotic nowadays because of the evolution of the LED technology which is color rendition. In fact, it's not so common in that need, but assuming that in some specific and very restrictive places, we will need color rendition, the technology allows us to provide good color rendition, but with uh, less, less than 5% of blue light, and all these keeping the same amount of um, light emitted. So the technology allows us to, re, uh, to provide recommendations, uh, which is very easy to, to fulfill. The next one, please. Well, as a complement, the anthropogenic intervention uh, near dark sky places to the minimize or avoid. Uh, it is also recommended to conduct systematic monitoring of the nighttime conditions uh, based on ground or remote sensing method like the use of drones and, and satellites altogether, of course, is a better option. Uh, another recommendation is the active management of those protected places uh, through best conservation practices available. Uh, and last, the, it is recommended to implement restoration plans when the darkness of a protected fly place is being lost. And all of those are the recommendations that uh, we have provided under the leadership of Dr. Uh, John Erringer. And the, the second part, the next one, please, is um, another working group, uh, which is the, the, the group of the... Sorry, I, I lost for a moment the, the, the feedback. Well, the next group, the, the next working group um, of our conference was the a protection of the environment. And here the discussion was great. It was a very interesting job, uh, so, so strong discussion. Uh, that is what's so interesting too, for, for the same reason. Well, uh, the, the next one, please. Uh, because otherwise I will take too much time. Well, I, I have to say that I'm not an expert. Uh, I rely completely on the massive knowledge and wisdom uh, of Dr. Mario Mota for all these slides. Uh, some massive scientific conclusions that uh, we have right now. First, that the uh, scientific evidence confirmed as a clear tendency that the impact of blue light uh, has to be considered as a main risk for our health, even for the environment. So blue light suppress melatonin, a hormone that influences circadian rhythm. Here we have uh, in the top right image, the melatonin blocking or suppression wave thing. And, that, and as you can see, even from the the green part of the visible spectrum moving to the blue, there is separation of melatonin if we are exposed to that uh, source of light. Even dim light can interfere with the circadian rhythm and melatonin separation. And of course, as I said before, the circadian rhythm also is affecting a uh, white light. So uh, next one, please. Well, the group was focused on uh, sleep research to trying to provide conclusions and, and, and considering the main streams in, in with all those, those conclusions, 
and it's for sure that light reduces the duration of sleep. Also, light delayed bedtime and also wake up time. It increases the daytime sleepness. In Spanish, we call somnolencia. And of course, like likelihood of having a diagnostic profile congruent with a circadian rhythm disorder because light relates our the temperature too and cortisol affecting our performance as you can see in the image on the right our alertness and motivation and then the end is affecting our behavior so light is relevant it's extremely relevant for our daily uh, life the next one please well all these circadian disruption affects our sleep our Cognition, as I said, the evidence being collected shows more prevalence of cancer, obesity, diabetes, mood disorders. All this is now under discussion. It has one on the right you have a, an example of a more treated with melatonin on the screen right and and the other one uh, with no intervention of melatonin. So it's easy uh, that we can conclude something regarding the use of melatonin uh, because uh, the, the size of the tumor with uh, the idea of melatonin is reduced. So just an example. The next one, please. Well, now, I will have a, a, a quick talk about uh, night as a living space. Uh, as you can see in this more table, uh, we have to consider the light as a living, unique uh, and space and a moment in which many species are more active or completely active at night. As we can see, 10% uh, of bats are all of, all of them, so nocturnal, almost like the same when referring to amphibia, all this happens uh, with many species. So night is a living space for nature, of course. Uh, the next one, please. So, uh, disruption. Uh, the effects of Alan on flora and fauna, please. Yeah. So the effects of artificial light at night include many species and ecosystems, biomas too. Alan affects uh, habitat, uh, migration, it reduces or alter ecological functions like food supply, reproduction, pollination, water verification, the immune response. And here you have an example of a cardumen affected by light on the right, but perhaps not much time to explain, but at, at, at the end, uh, even and a, and a small amount of light in our environment is producing impact, as uh, we can conclude with our uh, our job. So, talking about in the next one uh, about the general recommendations. The next one, please, just to try to finish on time. Well, the regulations for environmentally friendly lighting for country. Regions, municipalities, and community must be accomplished, which means uh, regulation must be applied at all levels. Uh, the implementation of the lighting scheme, which is so simple, the right light at the right place at the right amount for the right duration, even with the option of no light, which is it has to be considered in many installations. For example, with the technology. Uh, and also considering, for example, that if you turn on the light at any time you drive a car, which is compulsory, of course, you cannot drive on a road, on a highway, without turning on the lights of your car. Perhaps it could be easy just to turn off the light of all those installations of the flood, uh, the flood lights or the pictures of those places because you have your own light within your car. And also, one of the recommendations is the coverage uh, of most of the environmental aspect of artificial light at night or light pollution. Because um, although we have many studies, 
many areas are not covered right now. Uh, we have to consider that even very small amount of light is producing impact, negative impact on the environment. So we have to study many other species we are, which are not studied right now. And Connie, sorry for the amount of time that you spent, but the, uh, the, the many issues to be covered. Um, that's not a problem. I mean, you really, uh, you know, should not have had to squish everything. I'm sorry. I think, you know, we, we practice, but we <laughs> took longer, always take longer than we think. Um, so now we'd like to open up uh, the, the grounds for uh, questions from our audience. And we have a few so far already. And um, Richard, did you want to start? Because I see you've been collecting them in our chat, at our uh, Google uh, Doc here. Sure. So, um... We have a comment, I think, which could be very valuable for us from Hassan Barkbani, who says he wants to share how it is that you can um, help people relate to the issues of the night sky. Hello. Hi, Hassan. Have you heard me? Hi. We're, ha we're happy to hear from you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your good speaking. That was very good experience in this period of time. Uh, my, my model was very simple. I thought to my friends, just one way we have, we must go to schools. Everything is to hands off the teachers. Um, our experience here in the uh, south of Iran uh, have showed us just by school, we can uh, change everything. Um, we, we have a very good uh, experience about this as a festival and others and others, uh, but, but by teaching the teachers, we could change many things here. We are not a development uh, uh, area. We are a poor area. But one thing uh, we understood that if we want to change the attitude of the people, we must go to school. Uh, in Iran, we have a many group of um, teacher uh, that uh, they teach other teachers astronomy. By this, we could, uh, we could done many, many activities in around Iran uh, by using teachers. Uh, I had some um, experience that uh, I wish in the uh, new festival or new conference or other conference share to the uh, you and to the other teachers. But one thing I want to tell you, just one thing I think is important. I wish one day we could be able to connect all of the teachers in all of the world together to share their experience, to share their activities. I wish this. Now in Iran, we have a um, Iranian Teacher Astronomy Union, but I hope soon we could have an international teacher astronomy union to be able to share everything together and change the attitude of the teacher, to change the attitude of the people. I wish, I hope. I am waiting for this time. Well, there, there are programs like uh, Beatrice does with Rosa Ross on NASI, and that's worldwide in many, 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 many countries. And there's also um, uh, Rosa Doran, who has a program called Nucleo, and that they teach uh, teachers in many, 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 many countries as well. And there's the Office of Astronomy for Education now. Um, uh, that uh, the IU has introduced in the last year that will help be helping in that category as well, Hassan. So you and I should talk offline and I can introduce you to all these things. And if you stay for the next hour, we will be talking about some of the education aspects for dark skies education. 
uh, if, if you would like to stay and, and hear me and other and Mar Margarita talk about that. And um, if that's okay with you. Okay. Okay. okay thank you. <laughs> and Iran, I have to say, is one of the most premier countries for promoting astronomy that I have ever seen with all the uh, telescopes that they have, all the star gazing sessions they have. And it's a lot attributed to the Astronomers Without Borders. I just have to say that. We have two more questions at least. If it's all right, uh, um, Richard, we should ask. Okay, we had what I think is a comment, but we'd like to learn more about it from Walter Guevara Day, who says there are international regulations about the amount of satellites orbiting. And so it would be good to learn more about that. Uh, okay, yeah. Do you want us to answer or, or, or do we want to ask Walter more about what his Well, I think we about? need, if Walter can Are you unmute, there, Walter? <laughs> unmute and tell us some more, that would be useful because we've been working very hard on this, but we want to know what he knows. <laughs> yeah. So Walter, do you want to share what you know? The mute button's on the lower left, usually, of the Zoom screen. Okay, we'll, we'll kind of circle back to, to Walter, I think. Um, okay, let's, let's so our only comment on that is that the international regulations that we know about are from the International Telecommunications Union, who um, mostly referee the frequencies that these satellites will work on, but um, their reflectivity, reflectivity of sunlight and their um, uh, how many of them a constellation can have is not something that's actually regulated, it's just monitored. And so, you know, regulation that we could imagine um, would, it would say, you know, how many of these do you really need? You know, do you need 100% more bandwidth than anybody else? Because in most of these constellations that are planned have three or four times more satellites than the minimum to cover the area they want. And it's all about competitive bandwidth to have the best network so that you can get your videos in the Amazon the way you want them. Uh, and so, you know, we agree we can't stop world progress here, but it's not regulated in that respect. It's only regulated in terms of the frequencies that they are allowed to operate in. Yeah. Anything to add to that, Connie? Yeah, well, um, you did a great job, but um, it's really, really um, important that we, we have no regulations, with, with, as uh, Richard said, when it comes to the optical uh, side of, of astronomy uh, in terms of the satellite constellations and the whole effort here uh, with the working group on satellite constellations in our dark and quiet skies workshop, the second one that I mentioned in, in my talk, they are, uh, you know, gearing to create, we're, we're almost done creating a paper for the UN, uh, and that'll go forth to the UN delegates who have to be the ones that present all this, but we're trying to make it into uh, recommendations for basically regulations at some point on an international level, and hopefully, you know, something will come of that. But uh, it's a lot of effort, but it's worthwhile. So thank you for the question. And, um, we might want to go on to Margarita and we have a new one too after that. I don't know if we have too much time, but. Okay. Do you want me to? Um, yeah. I, I kind of addressed this preemptively in my talk. So mm -hmm. Margarita Safanova is, is saying that, you know, things are getting tough on the ground. And it's not like astronomers can say, don't launch any more satellites. It's not like we can't say, you know, you can't have any streetlights and, and it's absolutely right. Um, on the other hand, her suggestion is that therefore we escape and we put telescopes in orbit and on the moon and, you know, for our darkest, for our darkest access. And um, well, that would be great if we had unlimited resources is the short answer, but it's very, that's very, very, very expensive to have working observatories in places like that. And so they are justified on the basis of special things that you can't do from the surface of the earth. And so it, I think it's really worth doing both, having a very active space astronomy program, but 
um, really working our best to protect the sky that we have and, and trying to find some middle ground where we can preserve the observatories as best we can. Connie. Uh, yeah. So the next, uh, we have a little bit of music on our <laughs> line here. Um, so the next one, um, um, Rade Marjanovic. I have to tell you that we do have resources. He was asking about resources for teachers on dark skies, and we're going to spend the next hour on that. So, and at the end of it, I have a list of resources you can go for other projects for dark skies. So, if you stay with us, we can we can talk more about that in just a minute. So, what I'm doing now, if if, uh, if there's any more questions, you can address them, Richard, and I will set up for the next talk, if that's okay. So, Connie, I'm taking, uh, I'm sharing the. Do you want to, or do you want me to? I, it's I can, up to I, you. I can do it. It's okay. Okay. Yeah, I got it here. I think. Um, is that not? Okay. All I need to know from y'all is if you can see that. <laughs> can you see that? Yes. Oh, wonderful! I actually did something right, but I have to tell you that my my mouse or or uh, my my. Uh, key over here that advances is a bit trigger happy. So, <laughs> and I apologize again for sometimes following up on that. Um, all right, so we are here and welcome again, everybody. Did I, did we answer all the questions? I think we did pretty much. I just want to make sure. I have one more question on that. Oh, I have do you? It. I'm sorry. Yes, <laughs> and it's okay when uh, the satellites are doing their job and taking their data, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but uh, after some years, the satellites uh, would, would be, you know, out of uh, use. What is going to happen then? Well, that, that's true. It depends on the um, altitude. If they're closer to the Earth, they take less time to deorbit. Uh, and it, even SpaceX doesn't want to take a long time, believe it or not. They want to take less than five years, which to some people is still a long period of time. But, but if you're at 1,200 kilometers, it takes 25 years. They can, they can take up to 25 years to deorbit. It doesn't need to take that much time, but that's right now the quote-unquote rules, basically. And I, I think that's kind of horrid. <laughs> yes. It is one of the regulations that therefore yeah. we're pushing is to try to mm. Um, reduce the deorbit controlled deorbiting time as much as possible. Problem is, if they fail in high orbit, then you can't control, and it takes a very long. The drag is so low; it takes a very long time, and they tumble. Uh, probably, if uh, you know, a uh, lot of countries were pushing uh, on uh, taking an action, would be more effective. What do you think? If it means you are going to have a declaration at least signed by many countries, uh, declarations um, don't always have a positive impact. Okay. Um, they can be a bit too sensationalistic and uh, and actually offend groups. So you have to really. Um, it is better to to just talk with the different cultures, like the, the satellite industry, get to know them, understand them. They understand you, understand what the problems are that might be solvable. I mean, it's a longer road. Um, and, and I mean, petitions are sometimes good in the sense that you can get a number of people from the public involved and, and showing their support. That's often a very good side of it, but sometimes they can actually have a negative effect. Um, Richard, do you want to add to that at all? Well. But indeed, that's why we're going this route through the UN and its apparatus, because if in the end, the UN has some specifics saying you have beyond what's done in the other international regulatory framework, and they say you must deorbit on this kind of timescale, it will have been agreed to by the world's governments, if, you know, if it gets that far. So, so I think we need, you know, Connie is absolutely right. A positive engagement with the industry is the way to start because they'd prefer to do it themselves than have regulation force them to do it. But in the meanwhile, on the much longer, slower timescale, getting international regulation in place to make sure that there isn't a space full of slowly deorbiting junk is very important. And probably another idea is... Uh to have uh, uh, quickly an educational project 
like Globe at Night? Well, there, there is one. There is a citizen science program uh, that NASA has done called Satellite Streak Watch Watcher or something like that. So if you Google NASA and Satellite Streak Watcher, you can you, you can do a, set, a citizen science program on observing the satellites. You know when mm -hmm. when and where you, you observe them, and maybe I don't know if it does the brightness, but it should, but uh, maybe not. Okay. Yeah. So that's cool. <laughs> so um, let me see if there are any other. I think we caught most people's, uh, the sentiment of most people's questions, and I really appreciate all the wonderful questions and the wonderful insight you guys have. Um, and so in this part, we're hoping to satisfy um, the audience that know how to apply these in their, in, you know, in their schools. Um, and uh, and uh, we have a, a, a few things to say here. And I, I really would, would very much um, enjoy uh, you guys uh, being able to uh, get a hold of our PowerPoint somehow, and I have to ask Beatrice about this, uh, so that you can use them. You're free to use them in whatever capacity you want to with your students. Uh, so anyway, so I'll get I'll get started. That's assuming you want to <laughs> get, you want to use them. But um, anyway, so welcome to the second half of our our session. Turn on the night. Um, and I will say again, we are very pleased to be part of this capstone, uh, uh, this, ama this amazing conference as a capstone. And we thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, so during this, this second hour, you'll be hearing about Dark Skies education programs that you can use and the cultural heritage that is at the heart of why we, we, do, we protect our night skies. So let me get this going here. So our agenda, um, is, is just two talks this time. And the first one I'll be talking about uh, um, some educational programs coming to the dark side, as I call it, protecting your starry night sky. So I start with an introduction uh, that you might use with your students. I know you all probably know all this in some sense, but there's some ways that you can approach your students with this information, and I hope you'll enjoy it. And then, um, and then I'll also talk about one of our citizen science programs called Globe at Night, and then some other programs that you might use, choose to use in your classrooms. And then we'll have Margarita Mataxa. Margarita, uh, she'll uh, present on the cultural heritage side of things. And she is an astrophysicist who is part of the National Observatory of Athens and who teaches at the very well-known school, the Arasegeo School in Athens. I don't know if I yes. said that. Okay, good. Um, and, um, and at the end of our talks, we'll have hopefully a discussion period. And, and please feel free to open your mics too. You don't have to say everything in the chat, but either way, whatever you're comfortable with, and we'll get going here. So next slide. Um, okay, so here it is, my title slide. <laughs> um, okay, so imagine, uh, if you would, uh, that you lived next to the most beautiful green meadow filled with flowers and trees and a trickling stream and the whole area was just teeming with wildlife. And this place has been in your family for generations. You treasure this place. It has inspired your grandfather to become a writer, your mother to become an artist, you to become a musician and your daughter to become a scientist. What would you say if one day you found this landscape and the water polluted? Now imagine, I think, <laughs> uh, now imagine the landscape is the sky and it is the most beautiful starry night sky that you've ever seen. So many stars that you can't tell one constellation from another. And the Milky Way arching overhead is so bright that it casts a shadow of you on the ground. Scenes like this exist, but are slowly disappearing. Okay. So now imagine that you live in one of these cities that you see here. What kind of sky would you see? In this case, light pollution comes from the form of light by people for whom lighting up the night sky is commonplace. Lighting isn't bad but bad quality lighting isn't good. So the challenge to fix the problem then becomes threefold in, in three parts. First, you have to, you know, how do you convince people living in cities that there is a problem? 
if they've never experienced a night sky bursting with bright stars and, and streaked by the glow of the Milky Way, like you see on the Chilean mountaintop observatories I spoke of in the first, first hour. Second, how do you convince them to care? And third, how do you convince them to care enough to take action? Okay. <clears throat> So what other things do we lose when, when we no longer can view a pristinely dark starry night sky, right? Too much light at night or a prolonged exposure to lights at night can af uh, affect energy consumption. It can affect human health and it can affect wildlife. Okay, so those are, besides this astronomical research, which most people are not necessarily interested in, but they are interested in viewing the night sky. So. What are some of these instances? So we have billions of dollars a year uh, that are wasted in energy consumption through lights that are not shielded, that are shining up where we don't need the light and where, and also light staying on longer than needed. So, and then glare in the aging eye, which I'm kind of used to at this point, uh, creates hazards and, uh, and light trespass into your bedroom window makes it difficult to sleep. Uh, Circadian sensitivities in people, and that's related to our circadian rhythms, day, night, and stuff like that, they're disrupted, causing increased risks for things like obesity, depression, sleep disorders, and even diabetes. So uh, a depletion in our melatonin levels, um, and that's a hormone that's produced in the pineal gland in our brain that's in animals, and it regulates sleep and it regulates wakefulness. That level can, is actually um, uh, depleted when you have too much light at night, uh, and it can have ties to cancer. They have research still ongoing, so it's not solid, but it ha shows definitive ties. Um, <coughs> the habits and habitats of animals are negatively affected. Some animals are pushed to the brink of survival, basically, so migrating birds, uh, Hat turtles hatching on beaches, uh, try to get back into the ocean, and they're distracted by lights on shore. I mean, there's a lot of instances. I could have another lecture just on that. I'm sorry, another presentation, not a lecture, hopefully. Um, so the washed out sky, um, which impedes research astronomers uh, uh, to understand our universe and, and, and figure out our origins, it's also uh, obviously affected. Okay, so. So what can we do, all right? And these are some actions that you can share with your students too. And this is a very nice slide that is from the International Dark Sky Association. And their website is shown there, darksky.org. And you can find this particular thing on their website. Um, actions can be very, very simple and it starts at home, right? So you can ask for your own home. Does the outdoor light serve a clear and necessary purpose? Is the amount of light appropriate for the intended task, right? Do we need all of them? Are the bulbs energy efficient? Um, do the lights fall only where it's needed? You know, facing down and shielded, basically. Is the light connected to active controls? You may want to put it on a motion sensor and only have it activated when someone walks by or a timer when it turns off at 10 o'clock at night when you don't need it anymore for the rest of the night. That saves energy. Does the light source have a warm color, like a red-ish hue or yellowish hue instead of a blue, more harmful uh, color, as we spoke of in the last slide? <laughs> um, would you like to do more? You can, can do more by looking at uh, this website, darksky.org. That's the International Dark Sky Association. So that's um, a summary of that. So the next slide, <laughs> I love this slide because it has Yosemite Sam in it. As you can see in the lower part, he was part of my cartoon uh, experience when I was <laughs> little. But anyways, this is a great slide because it shows you, you have the kind of sky that you would have if you had a light, for instance, that uh, doesn't have any shield at all. And then as you get better and better shielding, you have a much better and better sky. And so we don't waste energy. We direct the light to where it's needed, not where it's not. And the better we do that, the better we're able to see the stars. It's, tr it's a truly win-win, win-win situation. Okay, so 
Uh, this is where I introduced the citizen science campaign called Globe at Night because it's one of our solutions to all of this that you can very easily implement with your students. It's a, um, Margarita made me say this, <laughs> but it's an extremely successful international science, uh, citizen science campaign to raise public awareness of the, light, the impact of light pollution on our everyday lives. And it's been running for 14 years with 180 different countries and uh, has uh, more than probably two thirds of a million people that have participated. So it acts like a foundation for learning about light pollution and, uh, and, and making uh, night sky observations as well. So let me go to our introductory slide for uh, this. This gives you a tiny bit more information. We do have a website that uh, has all this information. It's called um, uh, globeatnight.org. And it has a huge amount of information I might go into a little bit later if I have time. Um, and uh, this is where you, you actually submit not to an app, but it's actually a web page. It's uh, um, I'll show you that in a few minutes, what, what the exact address is. But that web page allows you to use it on any phone, on any browser. Um, as long as you have connectivity, you will be able to download the data. And it's a very easy app I'll talk about a little bit later. But we have people from ages 8 on up participating. And there is a 10-day campaign every month. It changes every month because the moon, uh, the phase of the, it depends on the phase of the moon. You can't have a natural light bulb in your night sky uh, lighting up your sky. So you, can, you, know, you have to be able to take dark sky uh, measurements. Um, well, you have to have measurements when the light of the moon is not there, so you can actually take uh, accurate measurements of how much light pollution you have in your night sky. So um, to date, we've had over 220,000 measurements, and, um, and that's my tiny introduction. <laughs> OK. And let me go to the next slide. Oh, oh sorry, I went backwards. OK, so I'm going to brag just a tiny, tiny bit about two countries that have knocked my socks off. Um, one is in second place right now for the most measurements around the world. So the first one um, usually is the United States. But for half a year, Australia was in first place. And uh, that was because in one night they had a promotion for the whole country. One night, June 21st, the longest night of the, of the year for them uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, they took they had a campaign that took 6700 measurements in one night and they made the guinness book of world records so it's pretty pretty impressive and now they have over 7700 but um that was impressive uh in this in the other country i want to just kind of oh i should mention too before i change if you see along the eastern coast of australia and along the southwestern coast of australia you have these little colored dots and the colored dots have a key on the lower right hand side here. So the brighter the dot, the brighter the night sky. That's how we do it in Globe at Night. And the darker the dot, the darker the night sky. And they have maps one through seven that if you are familiar with limiting magnitudes, that's what they directly correspond to. And that's a brightness level. Um, anyway, so the next one is the, the uh, it, as part of the country of Spain, a little island uh, or set of islands. Uh, this one is one of the islands in the Canaries off the coast of Africa. It's 700 kilometers, square kilometers. That's it. It's a tiny little island. And even tinier is this area where they took the measurements. Over 3,400 measurements, guys, from this little island. They're third place. So I have to brag and say, if these guys can do it, we can do it, most definitively. So how do we do it? Well, we have some uh, charts magnitude charts and if you are in um, say New York City or Athens or Paris or down in Buenos Aires or, or any place like that you're gonna have probably just a couple st stars in your night sky so it might be like chart one or chart two and that's what you would enter whatever your sky looks like you compare and see the closest chart to what you can see in the night sky and for this month the constellation of the month is Perseus because that is the one in the northern hemisphere. Oh, I forgot to do the southern hemisphere. I'm sorry. Oh, goodness. Uh, Perseus in the northern hemisphere, <laughs> sorry, has so many things to do this past few weeks um, for the December campaign.
I'm going to ask you, please. <laughs> Liliana, could you? Oh, who is that? Uh, I'm sorry. OK, good. Thank you for muting whoever that was. Um, anyway, so we have this uh, for the Northern Hemisphere, at least. We have Perseus. And these are the charts for the next uh, seven charts total. And as you can see, they get progressively more and more stars, which, which, which is analogous to having a darker and darker night sky where you can see more and more stars. And there's the shape of Perseus you see in chart four. It looks like an upside down Y in this case. Um, and uh, it's near a big a bright star called Capella and also the Pleiades. And that's how you might be able to find it. And so you're going to choose again one of these one of these um, uh, charts when I get to the, the, um, uh, the app basically or the report page you'll be able to see that uh, now the next three months January through March it's going to be Orion the Hunter for both the northern and southern hemispheres I'm happy to say it is a beautiful constellation to start with for those who have uh, who are teaching kids uh, in classrooms especially um, this one here is so bright in the night sky so distinctive it looks like an hourglass and uh, you might call this the Tres Marias here, the belt, uh, the three uh, Marias. So that's uh, very distinctive with an hourglass figure with Betelgeuse and Rigel at the very uh, opposite ends. And you have stars like Aldebaran in Taurus, the bull, and Procyon in Canis Minor. Um, and also Sirius is not on the map here, but it's below uh, um, Procyon, a little bit to the right. That's a very bright star in the night sky, and you'll be able to easily find this, this to do to take part in the Globe at Night campaign. So in chart one, you just see the two bright stars in Orion, and then you see the belt by chart two, and it gets better and better as you go to the next slide. And, uh, and you can use this as a measure of your light pollution levels again. So how do you put them basically on, uh, on our app? Well, it's not really an app, it's a report page. But um, yeah, how do you do that? I'm going to call it a web app because that's what we call it. It's a web-based app. <laughs> um, so um, you have an app and you go to Globe at Night. Whoops, sorry. This is trigger happy. You go to globeatnight.org slash web app slash so web app is one word and you will find if you if you feel like going there now feel feel free to on your phone or on your computer and you can follow along so that in in uh, question one it asks you if you um you know when you made your observations what date and time and in question two is going to ask your location and you can put your address uh, you can put the two street corners if you don't want to put your address that you're at and your, of course, your town and country, right? Um, you can put that you're near the Eiffel Tower if you're near the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> um, don't put it if you're not near the Eiffel Tower, but if you are, uh, that's what you can do. You don't need to put the latitude or longitude. It's going to actually automatically, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? translate that into a lat long, latitude and longitude. And it also has a night mode. I didn't want to tell you. So when you go out, you're going to take this app with you. You can put it in your night mode. You should wait at least 10 minutes to get dark adapted, right? And tell us to your students because otherwise you're not going to take a very accurate measurement. And that and that's the longest part. The short part is actually taking the measurement. It takes like 30 seconds. And if you have a smartphone, the coolest thing in the world is that this question one and question two get automatically inputted for you and you don't need to do it yourself. If your phone is a smartphone, it'll automatically register your observations in terms of time and, um, and, and uh, date and also location. And all you have to do is go to question three. And that's where you bring in, if you can see at the bottom left hand side, you have seven or eight different um, little thumbnail images of those charts I showed you earlier. You click on one of those, whatever you leave your click on is, you know, if you think that's your measurement of your night sky brightness, you leave it there. And that's it. And that, that's your measurement. Uh, and then the only other thing you have to put in is what the kind of weather you have. And there's four choices and it's pictorial. And you just click on the one again that most resembles your night sky. And that's all. And if you don't have a dark sky meter, which I'll show you what it looks like next, you just hit the, this in number six, you just hit submit and you are done. Submit data and you are done. It's as easy as pie.
as they say in the United States. <laughs> and so this is the sky quality meter. A lot of people, I'm surprised, a lot of people have these. Uh, I've given hundreds out to teachers to, in the past. I wish I had the finances to do that now, but uh, we used to, we've made lots of kits over the years, you guys, and we've given out lots of kits, hundreds of kits to teachers. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about the latest one in a few minutes. Um, it's, it's now available at a, at a store. Um, but uh, you, it's just a point and shoot. You click the start button and you hold. You make sure it's above your head first, that there's no nothing in the way, and you click the start button and gather the data, and read out the numbers. And that's the numbers you would put if you had a start. It's not necessary, but if you had an SQM, a sky quality meter, you could put it also into the Globe at Night uh, app. Okay. So very easily, and this is what our web page looks like. And what I wanted to point out. Whoop! Darn the trigger happiness of this thing. Sorry about that. Um, what I wanted to point out is that we uh, have lots of things, you know, things you can learn at the top of the page, uh, the dates to observe uh, and do the actual um, uh, campaign, the report page, where you can find all the maps and all the data, and you can go surfing in a couple different ways. Um, and uh, I could talk about that later. I don't know if we'll have time though. And the resources. So you have resources like postcards the activity guide, um, and also the, the web uh, pages are there in different languages as well. So there's in many different languages, like 26 or 28 different languages for these things. So it doesn't, it's not necessarily in English. And we even have it in, for instance, Thai and, and uh, different languages like that. And I think we're going to be soon translating for somebody that lives in Malaysia. So it's kind of a neat thing for next year. So we do have over 29,000 observations in our uh, 2020 alone. And uh, we're hoping to hit 30,000 before the end of the campaign, which stops on the 15th, I believe. Um, so just to mention quickly how this data can be used. Uh, people have used it to, to compare changes over time. They compare it to things like population density, density, excuse me, or if they want to find dark sky oases and see how dark they are there, or ordinances, ordinance compliance, or if they want to study the effects against uh, what, you know, like animals. We've had a number of those kind of um, uh, uh, projects or human health or safety, energy, uh, lots of things you can do as a, as a teacher, especially for those science fairs. And here's what some kids have done. They visualized their data in terms of 35,000 Lego pieces. This was done by a bunch of elementary school and middle schoolers. That was very, very, very impressive. And, um, and then we've also had high schoolers work with amateur astronomers and survey their entire town. And these are the data points here, the darker ones and the lighter ones. You can see this is like a business area in the upper left. This in the middle of the, of the uh, slide here is where the university was with a lot of globe lights. And they worked with their uh, city council to develop and strengthen their lighting laws or the ordinances. And it took a couple of years, two years, but they did get it done. And this is in the United States. And then, of course, we've had college level as well. Uh, this is a couple of students over a couple of summers who took data as a summer project uh, with the help of the Arizona Game and Fish, who had data on the particular bat called the Lesser Longnose Bat. This bat, for some reason, avoided city center uh, in Tucson, went around the, the, the light polluted area. And we wanted to know whether we had to strengthen the laws because this particular bat was threatened and endangered. And uh, we found out that it was one of three factors and it wasn't evidence enough. And one of the factors was light pollution, but it wasn't evidence enough to actually have to straighten, strengthen the laws. Very interesting project. Um, <laughs> anyways, but the last one I wanted to quickly show you is near and dear to my heart. This just happened um, about, a year, about a year ago. Two twins from Tucson approached me and said, you know, we want to uh, do something special for kids. On, and teach them about dark skies and light pollution. So they developed a website and it's called darkskiesforkids.org. So please visit this, use this for your classrooms. It is wonderful. They earned the Girl Scout Civil Award as a result of this effort and also an International Dark Sky Association Rising Star Award. So these kids did a great job and I'm so proud of them. Um, and, uh, and so I just wanted to say, here are our campaign dates uh, for next year. And you'll notice there are 10 nights each each month. And actually, there's another one in, at the end of December that uh, take, take, envelops Christmas, actually, <laughs> and New Year's. So that would be kind of interesting. Uh, so I hope you'll join us in any capacity that you can to be part of the Globe at Night efforts.
And here are our Dark Skies uh, programs that you can learn all about. And uh, please take a picture. I'll, I'll keep this up for a minute. Uh, take a picture of this and we'll hope to get this to you in other ways so you can just uh, click and go to the web pages um, because these are all active actually um, and we can maybe produce a pdf that has uh, the active uh, links in it that might be a way of doing it so um, thank you very much and let me see is that does yeah so we want to entertain questions but i can also leave it on the slide if anyone um, would like but i'm going to ask you ask you to hold the questions until uh, after margarita's um, uh, presentation um, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll uh, I think, talk more about any questions you have for Globe at Night and any questions you have for Margarita. Would that be all right with you, Margarita? So I can start, yes. <laughs> yes, or do you think we should go through some of the questions they've had on- Please, please uh, go to the questions. Okay, mm -hmm. so while, while it's fresh in everybody's minds and we'll, uh, we'll make sure to save enough time for you and your questions. You so. have the- uh, I think uh, three questions. You may proceed. Okay. Do you want to state them or do you want me to state them? Excuse me? Uh, okay. Oh, yes. So, so Jorge Munoz. The first, uh, the first, would you like me to state it? Sure. Okay. Uh, the first uh, uh, question comes from uh, uh, Maria del Rocio Lopez Hero. Is uh, do you know the NOC Zero project with Paulina Villalobos from Chile? Yes, I, I've heard of the project. I don't know too too much about it. Um, I would love to talk with you, uh, Maria, if it's all right, and and learn some more. Would that be? Is, are you online, Maria? People are so um. shy. <laughs> Yeah, we can learn. The, the question was from YouTube. Oh, YouTube question. That was cool. Thank you. That's why Maria is in here. And also the question was made by uh, Jorge Munoz. Okay. Can you tell me more about the Noche Zero project? I've heard about it. It's been several years that they've been doing it, but I don't know too much about their recent efforts. Could you uh, tell us if you know? I'm just transmitting the message. Okay, thank you, Jorge. Okay, um, Maria. Uh, the the oh. Yeah, I'm just telling Maria that she she and I should talk on on uh, e by email, and we'll give our email addresses at the end. Okay. okay. Next one. The next one is from George Zotti. Uh, he says that is a very nice app, but will not black stars on white canvas ruin dark adaptation does night mode have the map inverted um i think the uh <laughs> good question no it is, it's in a pink mode so it it it, it, it is in, in the red light basically so i don't think it uh, hurts the vision too much we've had had a very good experience with the app okay uh... Is there another question here? Let's see. There is one more, but I, I can't really understand it. Okay. I, I don't understand. Maybe uh, we will see it uh, later. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for your questions. And I, we um, really would love to hear more uh, that you might think about while uh, we keep on with the next talk. And uh, we'll answer all questions at the end. If Margarita, would you like to start your... Okay. So I would like also, for my part, to thank Beatrice for organizing the whole symposium, but also this session on light pollution. And I would like, of course, to thank... Um, um, uh, oops, Richard, Pedro and Connie for their excellent comprehensive presentations uh, either scientific uh, part on light pollution, either from the educational part. And what I'm here to say, and of course, I would like, of course, to thank all of you who, who are still with us, uh, although I know that you must be very, very tired. So uh, I'm going to discuss with you uh, the need of the night sky. 
and uh, that all this effort that has uh, been done and all that has already been presented for, by the uh, three previous uh, um, colleagues really worth the while because we have a strong uh, framework where the night sky is deep, uh, deeply rooted in uh, our, the humans. So I'm going to talk about the night sky and the scientific and cultural heritage that is connected. Uh, night sky, no, not yet. Night sky is there where the earth meets the universe. And it's the mean that uh, through which astronomy began. Astronomy is an ancient and multidisciplinary field. And it's uh, uh, considered as the ambassador of all sciences. Next one, please. So besides the value, the scientific value of astronomy, from here on, I'm going to say the, the uh, value of the night sky, the scientific value of the night sky. We have a strong cultural value that is uh, connected uh, with the place where our tiny blue dot is in the universe. And of course, night sky has a strong also economic impact since it's correlated, it's uh, connected with pollution-free industry, of course, also is connected uh, with the stimulation of developing uh, countries, which can host all this uh, astronomy infra infrastructure. And let's not uh, forget the astrotourism, the who is uh, lately growing and growing. Next one, please. So we're going to touch. Uh, the importance of the skies uh, as a windows to the universe heritage. The next, please. Konikan, okay. Uh, you can see this uh, excellent photograph, which was taken by the observatory of Cordoba in, uh, in uh, Argentina. I would say here in Argentina, but we are all virtually with our, in Argentina now. Uh, this uh, photo was part of the first IAUE light pollution exhibition, which was held in Vienna. And I think uh, by describing it, uh, we lose uh, all the meaning. Uh, it's no use of comment, uh, to comment on uh, the uh, photograph and say why the night sky is inspiring science, religion, philosophy, art, and literature. The next slide, please. But when it comes to uncontrolled outdoor lighting, then the stars are hidden. And then the perception of the night is changed. And then the new generations just don't know what is the night sky. Again, this photo is uh, from the first AAU light pollution exhibition and is taken from uh, the Optical Astronomy Observatory of the Republic of Korea in Boyunsan. Let's go to the next one. Na uh, night sky is part of our cultural heritage in a close and continual interaction of knowledge. It's been related to monuments, sites, connected with astronomical observation, dispersed all over the world, not only scientific, but also related to testimonies of traditional community knowledge. Let's see through examples what we mean. So, can you please click? Now here we see some cave paintings. Actually, we see the Lascaux Caves in France, which is a Paleolithic place where the, our first European ancestors made probably the first planetarium ever. And there they kept track of time. Uh, they were probably enjoying solstice and equinox. Next, please, please. 
we can also have stone engravings. And here is an astronomical diary from Babylonia, which is um, um, which was made around uh, the 2 BC century. Next click. We also uh, we also have uh, observatories, and here is an observatory uh, seven of the seventh BC uh, century in Boca de Portillas in Mexico. Next click, please. We have myths that are connected with certain constellations. Uh, Connie, in her previous talk, uh, said about the famous Orion and how can Orion contribute to the measure, measuring the light pollution. So this is heritage, cultural heritage connected with the night sky. And let me conclude about cultural uh, night sky heritage with a site, click please, um, Connie, with a site in Athens, the Pnica, where Meton observed sun and the moon, and where Meton fair, uh, made uh, his uh, famous uh, cycle. Next one, please. But of course, we can't uh, 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 deny the close uh, connection of scientific night sky with heritage. If it wasn't uh, for the night sky uh, and the exploration we do through it, we wouldn't provide curiosity and curiosity leads to innovation and innovation has changed our lives and has advanced our society. So if it wasn't for the night sky, click please, um, Connie, we wouldn't have explored our own globe, all the great explorations, uh, uh, knowing uh, about uh, India, knowing about uh, America, wouldn't have been done if we didn't have night sky. Through the night sky, we have gone to the moon. Click, please, uh, Connie. We have gone to the moon and we are um, uh, preparing more space travels. Uh, due to the night sky, click, please, Connie, we know that our universe is expanding. Click. We know that we are made from stars and dust. We all know this famous um, um, paragraph from Carl Sagan. And of course, we know our exact place in our galaxy. Click, please. All these evidences are scientific night sky heritage. So there are really good reasons why all this hard work, which was described thoroughly, by the three previous uh, colleagues worth a while. And is something that it's, I can say, uh, is imprinted in our DNA. So let's go to this next uh, slide. So night uh, sky is not only environment, is not only the animals, is not only the plants is not only the humans. It's not only the cities in the night. It's all of these uh, that I have mentioned. So let's say from here on, on nightscape and not night uh, sky. We have, of course, the, uh, the obligation to protect the night sky. Uh, promoting comprehensive and holistic approaches. And we have to prevent it in order to preserve astronomical observation, environmental protection, climate change, because as Connie has uh, told us, it's a lot of energy consumption that gives imprint of uh, carbon dioxide in uh, the air atmosphere and all these make, it has a portion to the climate change. And of course, we have to preserve for the global sustain sustainability. 
And this can be done through uh, responsible lighting. And uh, in um, uh, contradiction to other environmental pro uh, problems, it's quite easy uh, to turn to responsible lighting because when all the installations are out of use or can't be used anymore, we just uh, turn to the, to the right ones. The next slide, please. So we have now to protect this natural lab uh, with clear public lighting rules, with electromagnetic wave zero zones, with regulation of mining geothermal installation, with environmental regulation and, and enforcement, as have already uh, Pedro has uh, discussed and Richard, but don't forget the public education and outreach. Next slide, please. Uh, let's create, all of us, we are here in this uh, virtual um, conference room, intelligent educational outreach uh, networks using Lockup at night or other uh, educational projects that will make again the night sky available. Next, please. And uh, last, I would like to remind you that we have, a, we're very glad to have a new emerging culture, a new emerging culture uh, that uh, is in the biosphere reserves and old heritage sites uh, that have been introduced by the UNESCO MAN and the Biosphere Program. So in this new emerging culture, the recovering starry sky is included. In the background, you can see the uh, respective biosphere reserve of the central Amazon. And of course, each country, more or less, have its biosphere reserve. And the last slide. So uh, for the last slide, I would just like to share with you the words of the minister of Minister Pandu that experience in the night sky provides perspective, inspiration, curiosity, optimism, and hope. Uh, let's not lose this nightscape. Thank you. And waiting for your questions. <clears throat> okay. We've had a lot of conversation and uh, back and forth, but um, we're going to have to wait a few seconds here or a minute for mm -hmm. perhaps any questions people might have. We do have a good uh, nine or ten minutes to to answer them, so please mm -hmm. don't be shy, and we're we're e uh, eager to help uh, in any topic you want to address. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> uh, just just to to let you, uh, I'll get back to the. There are a number of projects um, too that we have. Uh, let me see if I can get back to that. That would be slide twenty seven or so. Okay, so here are some dark skies education programs you may be interested in. Um, there is one I tried to find online, and, and please forgive me, Beatrice, because I know in the past uh, that we have been at conferences together where Beatrice Garcia, through her NASI program, has shown me a couple of really, really well thought out uh, astronomy activities that had to do with dark skies and light pollution. And I was looking hard online for them and I could not find them. And um, she, she, of course, was too busy to, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, very, very busy and, and could not uh, yeah, respond. So. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one program that I think if, if she could tell us, um, we could uh, actually follow up on. Uh, no, I, I just, uh, I was uh, written in the, in the chat that uh, this is um, a problem, the light pollution is a problem uh, that can be solved with the uh, local solutions. So uh, it is very important, the education on this topic, introduce the topic in the school because it's not a normal topic uh, in the curriculum, 
the light pollution is uh, nobody knows what the uh, light pollution is the teachers doesn't know the teacher is uh, completely out uh, the pollution of the of the water air soil is uh, very well known but uh, nothing about uh, the light pollution so it's very interesting to to note uh, uh, the impact of the topic when you introduce the, the the subject in the school with the teachers and with the students and if i can show you just a couple of uh, slides just yes. a couple I'll can, stop can, I, can i share uh, Your, very, it's very all very yours short, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah it's just, just uh, a very short uh, not a complete presentation just a couple <laughs> No, no, no. Just a couple of um, examples. Uh, as you know, we have um, uh, an activity in NASA program. Um, let me see. Ever, uh, where is here? Um, no, sorry, presentation. Um, oh, no, 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 not from here. From this slide. This slide. Presentation. This slide. We have um, uh, an activity in NASA program with uh, an a special dark box in which uh, we uh, produce a constellation. Here is Orion. And um, uh, we use, uh, as you also use, uh, Connie, the, the, the ping pong ball and um, a, a light. And we generate a, a a luminary, as you can see outside on at the street, and we cover, we shield the luminary to show the differences between uh, the completely uh, well the, the 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 glow and with uh, with the shield. And uh, the next one, well, you can um, play with this inside the box with the camera and to show if you have or not. Uh, are you seeing the different uh, the slides or is uh, completely in the first one? Maybe I you think. have to put no, it in no, the yeah. presentation. No, don't worry, <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. Here, we have the box, we have a light with a ping pong ball and you can use uh, the, the ball as uh, the, the the globe at the square or the street and you can show how uh, if you block the the light you can produce a good effect on the sky and you also can take photos inside the camera inside the box etc well we had this activity as part of the NASA program with the students as you can see there and we work uh, uh, in particular uh, at this uh, site in the, the city, uh, this is two, two blocks from my office here. Uh, it's a school, a primary school, and all the street, as you can see, is illuminated by these uh, this globes, well, the balloons. And we work with the students. And after some time, we, uh, we solve the problem. We, um, uh, we reach the, the politicians and finally they, they change the, the gloves, the, the balloons for these other uh, luminaries with the sky, with the light pollution control. So the people, oh, sorry, here. Yeah. The people is the most important thing here. The people can change the environment, can change the environment in, in, a, good, uh, in a good way, but, um, that is uh, evidence. We can have uh, a very good uh, results if we um, teach about these things. I agree totally with Beatrice. And I would like to ask all the participants uh, in this uh, session, have they till now participate in uh, a relevant uh, um, activity? Do they have results? Could they communicate this with us, as Beatrice has uh, just done? It would be very nice to have all these um, results after implying, uh, implementing the various uh, projects on light pollution. 
So if you have already participated in a light pollution uh, project, please let us know. If you haven't, please join us. So yes. If I can, if I can point out, there's one person who has asked about a very interesting question. Uh, is there, you know, we have, uh, I, I put up again, the dark skies programs, education programs that I know of personally that, uh, and some I'm obviously involved with that I could, if anyone wants to know about them, I, I have a lot of information, but this person has asked about radio quiet, basically, I think is what, uh, they mean. Um, so any radio quiet, um, uh, projects, which is an interesting concept. I know of one radio quiet <laughs> activity that they use with like a, a radio as an interference source. And that uh, is done by CIRO or CIRO in Australia. They have a program called Quiet Skies, I believe. So if you do a Google on that, um, they have, they might have other things set up other than simply that one activity. That you might be interested in. Um, so, it, go ahead, Margarita. <laughs> I think that Richard wants to uh, be unmuted. Richard? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I guess do I have to ask you to unmute, Richard? Okay, I'm here. And so okay. I'm sorry. What was, what was your comment? <laughs> Margarita, you said you, Richard wanted to be unmuted. That's what was uh, on the screen. Oh. Well, good to have you back in Pedro too. And uh, I just wanted to make sure that uh, people did catch some of the programs that are on this list of dark sky education programs, uh, that there are kits and they have many activities that you would probably uh, be interested in using a few at least. And that's the quality lighting teaching kit which was produced uh, through the IAU for the International, International Year of Light in 2015. And as a result, a company turned that into Turn on the Night, which I think uh, Ryan is uh, one of the people that has told me he's using it, um, that we had given out um, <coughs> many of them to people across the world, world as a result of the International Year of Light um, at, at that time. Um, and uh, we have other programs for younger kids called Dark Skies Rangers. Uh, many different cute little things you can do with kids like the one on turtle hatching that they all pretend they're sea turtles. Uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful and they just want to keep doing the game over and over again. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of uh, good things to use as tools here. Um, so if you would be so inclined, please, please investigate and let me know if you have any questions. And I think we're pretty much at the top of our hour. Um, let's see if we have any. Margarita, can we look at the questions to see if we've missed anything that we want to emphasize here? Mm -hmm. Ah, yes. And people are part of the IAU Dark Skies Ambassadors mm -hmm. Program, which is listed here. And you can apply to be part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any special pro programs for them? Uh, Rosa? Ross, what do you mean by that? Do you want to, you can unmute yourself if you like. Yes, I, oh. I, it's possible to, to say something. Do you <coughs> me? I think that uh, Beatrice mentioned before, it is very, very important that uh, teachers know the problem and know the possibilities and give uh, some education to them. Because if we convince a, a, the teacher, the teacher is one person that repeats the concept to every year, every academic year to different students, then it is very important that uh, to convince them in order to introduce more information about this. They arrive to the students and also, uh, I put my camera maybe, and also, they, I, I think, uh, arrive to the society by means of the students. Uh, it is one possibility that uh, the society discover what is that, because the students arrive at home and they explain what they are doing with the teacher in the school. And this is, I think, it's one uh, serious opportunity to 
we've done a lot of information. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've had I've had um, a few hundred um, workshops for teachers over the last uh, few, you know uh, ten years or so, or so more. So uh, and using a lot of this material that I have here on this uh, slide. Um, but yes, and I haven't, uh, lately it's been more webinars because we we're in a COVID situation. So, but I have done that also with libraries and with uh, various organizations uh, around the world and, and conferences um, uh, like this, <laughs> but in more detail for teachers. Yeah, uh, with, where you go through the activities. Yeah, and I hope to continue to do that. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and if you want, I can help I do it with NASI too. We can combine efforts. Yeah. Can I make one more comment? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Uh, one more comment, because uh, George Sotti is here. I would like to, to say that uh, Stellarium also works with the light pollution. It's a very good tool to teach the situation. Uh, if you permit me, I have uh, an example for the people who doesn't know uh, the, the resource. I will share. I will stop just a moment. Your, your sharing, and I will share this uh, window. Uh, now I hope you will see in a minute. I hope. Can you see the Stellarium or not? Oh yeah. yeah. Well, uh, the Stellarium is a great software, of course, and uh, just it, this is just an example. Uh, you can control the situation and to, to show the difference in the sky with the different levels of light pollution. So uh, I recommend also to use this because it's a, it's a powerful tool for education. Thank you. Well, well um, I just put two and two together. Sorry, George. <laughs> if, you'd like to, if you'd like to say anything about your, your product, that would be wonderful. I use it all the time <laughs> for Globe at Night, yeah. I would like to say that in our courses in NASA, we always, recommend uh, Estelarium and we use it normally in all the courses. That yes. I think it's a very good, good uh, possibility for all the people in all the countries free of charge. This is very important. Well, um, yeah, thank you. Um, if I can share one screen with you as well. Please. Um, oh, no, yes, uh, perhaps, no. Uh, oh, yeah. Can you? Yeah, oh yeah, he's a panelist. Yes. Yes. So um, I just want to show you one view out of Vienna. That's the night sky on top of the Urania Public Observatory. Um, you can simulate a city skylight like this, city skyscape like this. Um, you see the light pollution from the city. Oh, yeah. um, just a few little stars. Uh, let's take away the uh, coordinate lines. Um, so you see how you can paint and how you can really make a realistic simulation of um, of a town. Uh, of course, the, the, the moon is enlarged for visualization. Um, well, let's let's take that away. Uh, so you, you just have to align a regular um, photographic horizon plus uh, light. The light uh, sphere. Um, and, uh, during, the, during the morning twilight, the lights will vanish seamlessly, as you can see, and mm -hmm. you have to regulate the daylight sky then. So this is, um, I think, a very illust um, nice illustration of, of uh, light pollution as bad as, as it is. Um, and if, if you uh, want to have an impression of how how the light may have been, let's say, 100 years ago, um, you simply turn down the... Uh, sorry, it's in German now. Uh, that's right. Um, landscape lab, in the landscape layer, you can switch off the illumination layer. So this may have been the sky of, let's say, the 18th century. Um, really dark at night, and, and now we have rather uh, sorry. Now, now we have something rather like this, and of course, with with uh, also global light pollution on. 
extremely so issues with, with this is what uh, which software is this that's Stellarium. Ah, the Stellarium. Okay. It's in, in Stellarium, um, this is a, a landscape that is not uh, not in a regular distribution. Um, but you can you can do this with your own favorite landscape. I have a different one uh, that's not run yet, but um, let's say the. I hope it's here. Yes, the, um, from the Kufna Observatory. It's it's a historical observatory within the city borders oh, of Vienna. Yeah. I've been there. Okay. <laughs> um, I did something similar. Just add in the lights of Vienna. Here the, we are on, this, on the right on the border of Vienna, so the sky is is clearly better. Um, mm -hmm. But there's still the city light here, and some. Well, I just painted some some lights on top of the towers, for instance, um, to get a, a more um, a clearer view where we are. And on the on the western outskirts, the sky is darker because uh, that's just on the western border of Vienna. Very nice. So I, I see a, a workshop in the making in the future where <laughs> Beatrice and Rosa and Margarita and I and George uh, or Gorg. George, how do you pronounce your name properly? Uh, it's Georg, but you Georg. can comment on it. No, no, Georg is good. Uh, yes, no. We can get, get, get together. <laughs> and I think it'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, it would be possible online yes all to together this is very difficult but but organize something yes like online this is easier the way of the future well yeah. we should think about that yes uh, yes, Georg, can we you can you switch in athens oh <laughs> can you see stellarium with uh, having athens as a city um for some other purpose, I did some Google Earth panorama of Athens, but I think without light pollution, that was for something completely for different, very different um, purpose. Oh my goodness! I've made so many panoramas. I'm, I, okay, I'm, we can talk. We can go another time. Okay. But we, we can. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Next time. If, if you have a good, <laughs> yes. well, it, it will take too, too long. But uh, you can really. Um, have Stellarium, I, I made a particular uh, talk in, in, in 2013, I think I was, it was the SEA conference in Malta, no, 14, uh, and I made this uh, at that time. So, yes, uh, light pollution is, you can you can have global light pollution with the bottle scale that has been in Stellarium since, I don't know, 2006 or so, that was way before my time, and the, the particular light scape like this, um, that was my work of 2014. I think it, it really makes a uh, nice um, a possibility to illustrate what's happening here. Yes. yes. Uh, excuse me, you have also included prediction of future. Uh, oh. No, not, not really. Not, no. Um, this, is, this is only the illustration, not the painting. Perhaps a... the future is better. Uh, Why <laughs> do you think it No, <laughs> according to the funky <laughs> maps. <laughs> okay. That's well, another uh, possibility. We can get together with Fabio Falci and see what we can do. Yes, yes. Uh, well, we, we have plans, but of course, it's, it's also always a matter of time and money. Uh, sorry to say that, but we have, I mean, there are ideas how to maybe get some light pollution prediction from the Falci maps or so and, and do that automatically. Um, but of course, it will. it is very difficult to really say um, where is the, the largest light pollutant? So this is really just an, an estimate that here is the city center. Of course, it's brighter on the horizon than here in the in this area where the, there is a forest in the foreground. Yeah, and you also have you have the, have the added um, challenge that you, the faulty maps are looking down and you're looking up, and there's yes. these things to consider. So yes, so really well, predictive model is is beyond my uh, my at my current knowledge. So, uh, but but if there are models, of course we can. We can and should uh, do that, probably. Probably you can also put the satellite constellations. Uh, there is a satellite plugin, you know that. Uh, so we can show satellites when you have the ephemerides, if, if you have the orbital elements. Uh -huh. But if you compare, if you compare the, the NORAD agency tracks at the moment, I think 17,000 objects, and now we get 100,000. This is so, uh, I have no words for that, really. <laughs> it's, it's shocking. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, and, and one place to go for the um, positions is the uh, Celeste track. There's a, I can, I can, if, if you want to talk in the future, there's a supplement uh, in there uh, that, that mm -hmm. has the latest and greatest uh, positions that you can grab. Yes, if you I want. think we're using also Celeste track, but we just have to configure okay. uh, the, the elements and then we, um, yeah, but I mean, I mean, can you imagine the sky was always the, the, um, <sighs> The, I, 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 I'm missing an English word, sorry. Uh, the view of the sky is, is a very calm thing. And now suddenly you have satellites zipping all over the place. That's really, it, it changes the appearance of the sky very, very much. Yeah. You, you're, you're preaching to the choir here. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. so sorry for interrupt, but we need time for the next activity. Yes, oh. okay, okay. Uh, and, and you know that you have uh, about 40%, 80% of the people who are, who are here <laughs> at the height of everything. They're still with us. And I want to thank everybody for sticking with us. And, and, uh, and it was incredibly interesting. And we were very honored to be here. Uh, thank you again, Beatrice. And thank you again, Rosa, and everyone else. It was That's a pleasure. Well. And Richard, thank you. Thank you, you all. Bye-bye.